My name is Kim Gillis, and I'm the current chair of the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to welcome you all to the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce's 29th annual economic forecast. <laughs> Our economic forecast today is presented by Toyota, M&T Bank, and Comcast Spotlight. So thank you to all of those sponsors. As our area continues to show progress on the economic growth front, a carefully crafted plan based on good data is essential for success. Today, we've assembled a very knowledgeable group of presenters from academia, government, and local businesses to provide you the best information possible for success. This event is made possible with the assistance from our partners who we'd like to recognize. The Tri-County Council of Maryland's Eastern Shore, Salisbury University's Purdue School of Business and Beacon Group, John Hickman and his team at the Small Business Development Center, Warwick Community College, and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I especially would like to thank Dr. Juliet B. Bell, President of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, for hosting us today. I'd like to ask Dr. Bell to please come forward now with a few remarks. Well, what a pleasure it is to have you all here on this nice and brisk day. Um, I don't think I'm going to have any trouble with people falling asleep because it's uh, pretty chilly out there. But uh, to the presidents and office, president and officers of the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce, community members and friends, again, good morning and welcome to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, we are very proud to host this year's economic forecast meeting, and I know that it's going to be a very interesting and exciting day. I want to thank the Chamber for organizing this most important event for our community. Each of the businesses, organizations, and community leaders represented in this room contribute greatly to the economic growth and development and sustainability of our region and of our state. And we at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore are very proud to have an opportunity to do our part. Uh, as you may know, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore was founded in 1886. We just celebrated our 130th anniversary. We're very proud of that. And our campus has grown substantially over that 130 years to over 1,000 acres now and home to almost 4,000 students. Our students come from all parts of the state of Maryland, across the country, and from dozens of foreign countries as well. UMES is also Maryland's 1890 land-grant university with an agricultural base, and it's one of the state's four historically black colleges and universities. We have been ranked in the top tier of a, among our peers by US News and World Report for um, since that ranking started uh, over eight years ago. And we now have eight, 28 accredited academic programs, including our School of Business, which is accredited by AACSB, and our engineering program, which is accredited by ABET. As we move boldly into our new millennium, we look forward to and seeking uh, and look to seek new and innovative ways to deliver education and prepare our tech-savvy students for the workforce that they will need to encounter as they move forward. We're looking at preparing them for careers that we need right now and right here in our community in our own backyard because we want them to come, learn, grow, graduate, and stay. Through our distinctive programs, UMES fuels economic growth and opportunity in Maryland by producing highly trained professionals and solutions for Maryland's leading industries, including agri agriculture, aviation and aerospace, IT and cybersecurity, business and entrepreneurship, energy and sustainability, health and hospitality and tourism. One of my priorities is to increase the university's support to the greater community. I want UMES to be recognized as a reliable source of educated and skilled workforce 
that is trained to provide solutions to the challenges of the Eastern Shore and beyond. As a university that focuses on all disciplines and putting a significant portion of its resources into fields that meet the needs of our local and regional community. As a proactive and responsive source of research and information to anticipate opportunities and provide needed data to the local and regional business community. And as a viable and engaged strategic partner to the business community in collaborative efforts designed to improve the life of the Eastern Shore residents. As a university, we believe in and support the dreams of our local entrepreneurs and want to help them grow and help our local businesses grow as well. We are working hard to be all of these things and more and to succeed and we need you, your help. We need you to let us know what your workforce needs are. If there are significant gaps that we are not filling with our graduates, we want to know about that so we can help to fill that gap. We want you to open your doors to provide opportunities for internships and opportunities for experiential and hands-on learning for our students so that they gain experience with you here on the Eastern Shore and perhaps when they graduate will be more inclined to stay here. We want you to meet with our faculty and students, visit our campus as you are doing today, come and see our facilities, and see for yourselves what we have to offer. We want your input, we want your insight, and we want your opinions so that we can continue to improve. So again, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, you are always welcome at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and I know that this will be an exciting day. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Such a pleasure to see each of you, and I uh, echo Dr. Dr. Bell's sentiments today. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Darius Arani. Darius Arani serves as the Vice President for Innovation and Applied Research at Towson University, my alma mater. And in this role, he fosters development of partnerships between businesses, government, and education. As Vice President, Arani provides leadership and management to over 70 highly skilled professionals who work on campus and in state agencies across our state. Collectively, his team works to improve the quality of life for all Maryland citizens and to promote the economic vitality of our state through four service areas. They include applied research and technical services, Center for Professional Studies, Entrepreneurship, and the Office of Partnerships and Outreach. Additionally, Arani serves as Chief Economist for the Regional Economic Studies Institute, or RESI at Towson University, a policy group that provides economic, fiscal impact, and policy analysis to state agencies, nonprofits, and private sector firms. During his tenure at RESI, Dr. Or Arani has managed and served as lead economist on several projects, including over 250 research and, analysis, research and analyst projects. He has produced over 100 economic and fiscal impact statements for a diverse portfolio of clients. Irani is often called upon to provide economic presentations to organizations across our state. He has appeared on CNN, The Mark Steiner Show, WYPR's Midday, and Maryland Public Television's Business Connection. He is often quoted in articles published by the Maryland Daily Record, Baltimore Business Journal, The Baltimore Sun, and The Washington Post. Won't you join me in welcoming Darius Irani? We live in interesting times. You know, we're in month 90 of an economic recovery. You know, by all measures, we've done very well. Uh, housing prices have, have recovered. Employment, unemployment has gone down to below 5%. Uh, job creation is about 180,000 a month. Uh, gas prices are, are, are low, but they're sort of creeping up a little bit. Interest rates are low, although the Fed raised interest rates yesterday by uh, a quarter point. So by all measures, we should be very happy. But if you do a poll, many people still feel that we're in a recession. And, and our recent election sort of, it, it, it sort of showed that. 
we saw that basically many people were bypassed by the economic recovery. Many individuals who are hardworking, you know, have you know have hopes and dreams, were never able to achieve those hopes and dreams in the last eight years. The recession, the, the recovery completely bypassed it. So we're kind of going to embark on a little bit of a forecast. We've got 20 minutes. I'm going to move as quickly as I can. Um, I've had plenty of cups, cups of coffee, so I'm ready to go. So what I'm going to do is it's kind of broken into two parts: a national for, a national outlook and a state outlook. Um, and within the national, we'll look at the components that make up sort of the GDP, consumption, investment, uh, net exports, government. And then we'll, we'll discuss each of those and kind of see where they are because those are going to be the drivers of, of, of growth in GDP. And if they're not growing, GDP definitely, definitely is not growing. So uh, gross domestic product. So historically, we grew about 25 to 3.5%. Historically, post World War II to about you know the early the late early late 90s. Recently, our growth has been somewhere around 1% to 2%. So we've kind of had a bit of a dip in our growth, not very fast. Um, you know, about 18 trillion dollar economy, good solid. You know, and you can look at sort of our our, our last experiences with the uh, 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 recoveries. You can see the 1960, we had a 106 month recovery, all the way down to the 2001, the dot com bubble. 73 month uh, 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 recovery, and then our most recent one, 89 months. You can sort of see also the growth, the, the growth of, of GDP, 4.9% in the 1960s, 42 in the 80s, all the way down to 2.1%. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of think, if you recognize the time periods that we were there, so think about 1960s, who we were. We were really the only economy in the, in, in the world. Japan hadn't really fully recovered at that time. Um, we were in the space, space race, we were fighting Vietnam War. But we were really the only economy. Even in the 1980s, with the rise of Japan, you know, we we're still pretty much the predominant economy. We began to see that slipping. We saw the uh, rise of the internet in the 90s. Um, we had the uh, uh, sort of the uh, Iraq War to, uh, uh, 2001 uh, onward, and then our most recent recovery. In our most recent recovery, we are part of the world economy. We cannot sort of say, well, we're, we are it. We are the largest economy, yes, but we've also got China, Japan, uh, Europe is, is, is pushing up against us. We have the, the BRICS sort of kind of struggling along. But generally speaking, we are not it as we once were. Looking at our recoveries, and some people say, well, you know, we've recovered. These numbers are great. We've got low interest rates. We've got low gas prices. Why aren't we happy? Well, if you look at sort of the recovery sort of indicators, um, and real GDP growth per, per capita disposable income and non-farm growth, you can see that in our recovery, for all measures, with one exception, our, our growth has been, has been lackluster. So when you look at sort of our real GDP growth in the 1980s Reagan recovery, it was huge. Look at our per capita dis, uh, disposable income in the Reagan recovery, it was huge. Compared to our light blue area, it was very small. The only area we had some good strong growth in non-farm was we were a little bit better than the early 2000 recovery, the dot-com bubble. Um, but generally speaking, our recovery indicators have been sort of somewhat lackluster. So that may be the feeling of malaise. We're, we're, not, we're doing okay, but we're not doing that well. Now, we are a nation, consumption. So if you look at GDP, it's, it's C, consumption, plus I, investment, plus government expenditures, G, plus net exports. Consumption is our, by far our largest component. 70% of our economy is driven by consumption. Consumer behavior, households. We are a nation of see it, want it, buy it. We are the nation that only has organized trips for shopping on Black Friday. So imagine that. We are, of, of, of the world country, we are a nation which basically organized trips to go shopping on Black Friday. We, we're open on our national holidays. You know, so Thanksgiving evening, you can pop into many stores and buy your pre-Black Friday, you know, uh, uh, goodies. So we are dedicated to shopping. And, and you know, our, our adage was, you know, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. So we, it's, it's girded into us. We have about 120 square feet of retail per person in the U.S. compared to our next, next close competitor, about 19 square feet. So generally speaking, we like to shop. Which means that when we, we're, we're feeling good about ourselves, we shop. But we didn't feel so good in 2008. You can sort of see it must have been really bad for us to pull back our spending. And, 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 dri and driving that was basically the fact that we lost a lot of wealth. Our houses fell in value, boom, wiped out a, a, a huge amount of wealth in our economy. 
Now we've recovered, you can sort of see we're still spending. Um, it's going ups and downs, but generally speaking, you know, we're still spending money. Uh, most recent data show that we had a fairly good uh, uh, holiday, the beginning of the holiday season, though not as big as we predicted. Surprising for economists. Um, you know, so we think about sort of the unemployment, sort of why people sort of may be unhappy. You can sort of see the uh, unemployment rate, which is typically reported, which right now is just under 5%, and the thing in blue is the underemployment. So individuals who may be marginally attached to the labor force, individuals who may be working part-time, um, are sort of that blue area. So you have a much larger, at the peak of the recession, it was almost 18%. And included in that, so think about part-time work as well. So prior to the recession, 16% of the labor force were working part-time voluntarily. During the recession, it creeped up to almost 20%. So nearly one in five workers who were working were working part-time. Now we're down to about 18%. So we started from 16% part-time to about 18%. So now we have a few more people who are employed, but working part-time who would otherwise prefer to work full-time. The labor force participation rate, you can sort of see, looking at males, uh, in the prime age, 1948, 96.6, down to 2015, 88.2. The Xbox factor may be in play here, um, as individuals realize that Halo 3 is coming out. In the 1948, we had all individuals, total U.S. This includes women. You can sort of see the rise of women in the 1970s that are in the labor, uh, labor market more aggressively. We're down to 62.6% um, in 2015. Um, the lowest it's been since 1977. And in that era, we were in powder blue and roughly, roughly shirts. So quite a big change in our, in our economy from, from then and now. But generally speaking, this is a concern. Why are people dropping out? And what are they doing when they're uh, dropping out? And quite frankly, the research is a bit sort of uh, not quite conclusive on this. But generally speaking, many people have felt that you know the, the market has bypassed them, and they're no longer able to be engaged. Uh, home prices, you can sort of see July 2006 case uh, case Shiller, 184. Our most the furthest drop was in February 2012. We have uh, crept up to where we were uh, pre-recession. So good news, we've recovered now. Prior to the recession, if you had a pulse, you qualified for a loan. That's all it requires. The pulse, a piece of paper, your signature, you got a loan. Since the recovery, banks have decided that may, that may not be sound uh, you know, financial uh, practices. They've sort of tightened up to the point where they're now doing 80% loan to value. Which basically means even though home prices have recovered, House homeowners cannot pull out that equity as much as they used to. So if we look at this in, in the 19, in, in early two, in, uh, before the recession, homeowners were basically pulling out money out of their homes like crazy because they could. You know, banks were offering interest-only payments, 100% loan to value, in some instances 110% loan to value. They were going crazy um, because basically it was they 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 thought this was a never-ending uh, trip. And you can sort of see in the, uh, in the, in the bar chart here, the percentage of homes with negative equity. In the recession, uh, peel recession, were about 30 to 35% of the homes. Since then, we've kind of declined. The U.S. is about 12.1. Maryland is 17.7. And Salisbury at 20.4% uh, of homes are underwater. Which still means that basically many individuals, one in five individuals here in this region, cannot borrow against their home because they don't have as much wealth. <coughs> so, how happy were we? How happy have we been sort of all these past recessions? Using the University of Michigan sort of a consumer sentiment, you can see the 1980s recession, length of recession, six months, about 69.8. The benchmark is about 100. So 100 means you're happy. Anything less than 100, you're not happy. Anything more than 100, you're really happy. So the 80s, 90s. Now the dot-com bubble, I don't know if this was schadenfreude, but people felt, oh, those young kids, those that, you know, pets.com, anything.com, they got their comeuppance. You know, 18-year-olds are making their paper millionaires uh -huh. But you know, we were very happy in the 2001 recession. How did I? In this recession, we were really upset. Very, very sad. Most recent data shows that about 87.8% uh, in terms of the consumer uh, sentiment index, most recent data. But generally speaking, during our recovery period, or during the recession, we were really morose. We were sad. We were so sad we didn't even go shopping. That's how sad we were. Imagine America being so sad that they didn't go shopping. Imagine that, you know, that's apocalyptic. There's movies made about this. Um, looking at our, our gas prices, we had a, you know, a gas price of $4.05 a gallon in 2008. 
Now we're down to 226. I mean, I see more and more you know, big SUVs and, and, and trucks driving down the, the, the place than ever before. But we're still not happy. Now, prices of gas are probably going to be poised to go up um, as OPEC has sort of decided to constrict uh, 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 production. Monthly job openings. So the line in blue is separations, and the line in red is openings. Now, you can sort of see in the recession, the number of separations was greater than the number of openings, which basically meant you got let go, it was tough for you to find a job. Now, if you look over in the 2014 uh, period, you can sort of see the number of openings is greater than the number of separations, which basically means if you're separated, you probably find a job pretty quickly. So that's good. Real uh, mean household income. So you know, recently, we had a huge jump in household income. Huge. About 5.7% on average. Huge, big jump in income. They went all across the board. However, however, in 1999, our real median household income is still higher than it is now. When Prince sang that great Tom, yeah, you know, part of 1999, we were this number, 57,909. Uh, 2015, 16 years later, we only got to 56,516. So our median household income has actually declined. It's actually less than it was in 1999. And you can sort of see the broad-based recovery of household income, all quintiles, you know, saw an increase in 2015, uh, all substantial. So that was good news. That's the uh, first piece of good news. You can sort of see in, during the recession, it declined. Even in the recovery periods, uh, growth in median household income was very lackluster. Now, what does this all mean? So we've got people who've got great jobs and maybe working part time. You know, you've got uh, you know houses that can't be you know leveraged as much as they were. So we broke down spending into three types of categories. Durable goods, which would be your cars, washing machines, refrigerators. Non-durable goods, which would be sort of your clothing, anything that sort of lasts less than three years. And then services, sort of your uh, haircuts, dry cleaning, that kind of stuff. So you can sort of see during the recession, uh, pre-recession, the light blue, we were spending a lot on durable, non-durable, and then uh, 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 services. During the recession, how much we pulled back on those. If you're not buying a house, your house is being foreclosed on, you're probably not going to buy furniture um, and or car. And then in our post-recovery, with the exception of durable goods, and I would argue that most of that's driven by low interest rates and cars, we're not spending as much on, on these non-durable goods, which we replace pretty frequently, as well as services, compared to the pre-recession. So we've pulled back a little bit. Now, I would characterize our typical household now as driving probably a newer car, wearing older clothes and fairly unkempt in terms of their hair. <laughs> so that's sort of the, the typical consumer now. But that's a big thing, right? So if you think about non-durable goods, they're being replaced every three years, if not quicker. And you talk about fast fashion. So if people are pulling back their sp uh, spending on things that sort of you know, cycle through the economy, that does have potential sort of what, what's our potential for growth. Remember that consumption is about 70% of our economic activity. So we're pulling back a little bit, so maybe some of that, that, that 1% or 2% growth is driven by uh, consumers. Investment, so this is anything that is you know, built to produce uh, something or to sell something. It also includes uh, housing. So this tends to be a built volatile, about 10 to 15% of the economy. Um, and again, you can sort of see just the swings. Uh, you can see the 30%, 40% change. A lot of this is inventory as well. So when firms replace their inventory, it swings up, swings up or down. You can sort of see that even a, even a large spike in a particular purchase will also cause the numbers to go up. So here in 2014, we bought a lot of, bought a lot of airplanes. Put them the number one way up. Inventories, you can sort of see how much big swings there are and how choppy they are um, around the, the zero number. So very, very big swings in inventories, which could influence investment, which could then contribute to economic growth or economic slowdown. Um, housing, again, is, is housing, building housing is part of the investment equation. Uh, you can sort of see pre-recession about 2,000, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 2 million units per, per year. Post-recession, we're just under, under 1,250. So a big decline in that sector. So think about that sector, that buys a lot of wood, uh, uh, nails, steel, all that kind of stuff. If that sector is cut back, and even in the recovery, we're at 1250, which is basically a lot lower than it was in the peak. 
It, it, it does pretend to be kind of bad news. And we've got more people living in the U.S. So investment is, 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 is good as growth, but it's not going to be sort of sustainable because it's, it's very choppy. It's up and down. You know, when we look about four, when we talk about first quarter, we'll probably see a big jump in investment because firms will plenish inventory to make up for the holiday season. Government spending, you know, it's both a mixed blessing and a curse, right? So we're in a, we're, you know, the last six years, there's been a real resistant, resistance to spend government money, right, to grow it. We don't want any more projects, we've got a big debt. So that's kind of a concern, right, because that's part of components of GDP. So here we have government spending, um, a little bit of science fiction, and you can sort of see just, how, you know, our number went up in the, in the, in the recession again as we outlay unemployment number, uh, unemployment insurance, <coughs> and, as well as any kind of uh, Cash resistance, those numbers went up. We've kind of uh, gone down. We're about $2.9 trillion, about 10% of the economy, maybe a little bit more. And you can sort of see our, our, our deficit. You can sort of see the re recession has slowly kind of gone back to about minus 2.46. This is the chart I think is the most scary chart. This is sort of the, our debt as relative to GDP. So pre-recession, we're probably about 60% of our, uh, of our debt, you know, debt to GDP. So, <coughs> You know, we had about, uh, about uh, something about $11 trillion in debt and about $18 trillion in GDP. Now we're about $18, billion, $18 trillion in debt and $18 trillion in GDP. So almost 100%, maybe 100%, maybe more, actually it's 100%. Which means, what's our capacity to borrow more? Now we can borrow more if we want. We're, you know, with the US government, we can we print money, we can borrow as much as we want. The question is, do we have the political capacity to borrow more money? And I don't know, for the last six years, I've heard the rhetoric that basically we should be increasing the debt. Well, here we now have a situation where, A, number one, whatever fiscal policy tools we might have to get us out of the next recession, we may, they may be foreclosed upon. And people say, well, no, we just use monetary policy. Monetary policy is great at slowing down economic growth. It's sort of like pulling on a string. But imagine trying to push on a string. Monetary policy, lowering interest rates, doesn't do much to sort of encourage activity. Because again, if the economy is going south, having low interest rates to borrow against won't do it for you. You say you have no clients, you have no customers, so why are you going to borrow the money? But fiscal policy tends to be much more stimulus now that we're almost 100%. Now we've got a new president coming in who wants to lower taxes and also increase investment. But yeah, the infrastructure spending, we don't have any particulars on this. We don't know what exactly is going to happen. Um, and looking at sort of where we are, so Chile tends to be better than us, and we're sort of, and the red, white, and blue is, is us, USA, and then Greece. So we're kind of on the heavy borrower side, um, and compared to Chile, Luxembourg, um, Norway, uh, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Poland, Austria, Austria Finland, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Ireland, Hungary, Austria, uh, Great Britain, Spain, even Spain, and France, even France. So we, our, our debt to GDP is much higher than those countries, and it's lower than, say, uh, Belgium, um, Italy, and Greece. Yay. <coughs> and here in Maryland, right, so we're very particularly vulnerable to defense spending. So all of a sudden, 2008, now we're pulling out of a war, we've got, you know, 2013, and we've got our president basically announcing on Twitter that, hey, this deal with the F-35, that's kind of expensive, should we pull back? Again, Maryland here, we're pretty, we're pretty sensitive to defense spending. So, I mean, I think you know Donald Trump has some great ideas. He's obviously going to be pushing for infrastructure spending, tax cuts. But again, do we have the political will as well as the financial capacity to absorb all those increases in spending? Because if you cut taxes and you raise spending, by my reckoning, I'm, a, I'm no accountant. I'm no accountant. I'm an economist. I can make numbers dance around, but I think that might create a situation where we have an increase in deficit which would then sort of be a concern. Because one thing about deficits and future deficits is it means that consumers are going to end up paying, households are going to end up paying for the futures. So they may actually cut back their present time consumption to consider they could be paying future time taxes. So net export. So we think that government spending is there. It's probably going to remain constant. It may go up or down. But it's not going to be an economic engine of growth. And it really should not be an economic engine of growth. We should not be relying on the federal government to be our growth makers as we go forward. During the recession, we can ask for a stimulus package, but during the sort of recovery, it needs to be there to make sure that A, the roads, roads you know, are nicely paved, there's national defense, um, all the basics. Now, next part, so maybe we can go the rest of the world. The rest of the world can maybe help us. Now, there's one small problem, our dollar is very strong, which means our exports tend to be very weak. 
uh, comparatively. And you can sort of see here, during the recession, our net exports actually uh, you know, declined to minus 400 billion, which basically means we, um, our net exports are imports minus uh, exports. Being negative means basically we imported more. Majority of the goods imported to the US are used for intermediate production goods. So the Ford car that is made here in the US, it might have wipers from Mexico, it might have an alternative from Germany, it might have tires from Japan. And again, that is the, uh, let's go have an, an export. <coughs> again, we're finding that pay and export related industries tend to pay more. I know we've seen a large decline in manufacturing in the US and many people say, oh, that's because of trade. Well, actually, a study out of Ball State shows about 83% of the jobs lost since NAFTA was signed was primarily due to technology, to automation, to basically improvements in manufacturing processes were driving the trade. And you can sort of see, looking at our productivity uh, uh, gains, is how, how much we've increased our productivity since the uh, mid-'80s, and then basically how much our employment has fallen. So basically, companies are producing more with less people. So will, will trade be sort of an answer? Well, we've got a couple of headwinds. A, we've got you know, strong dollar, which means our ex exports aren't as, aren't as a, a, a valued as others. We've got a world economy that is not growing. We are the, the world leaders of economic growth. So I would say right now, I'm saying right now, as long as consumers are happy, I think we're good. But there are a couple of headwinds that are going to push against us. Number one is going to be the world economy, and there's also going to be uh, government spending. How is that going to impact? And we don't have any certainty around it. We've got a lot of uncertainty around the government policy. We've heard tales, we've heard story, we've heard Donald Trump talk about his policy about sort of I'm going to increase infrastructure spending. We don't know how that's going to take place. What is it going to look like? There's no details. He's also got to get past the Republican, uh, he's got to get past uh, Senate and the House. So economic forecast, which we've been waiting for. So Maryland, real quick, um, $330 billion economy. Uh, our relative uh, growth compared to our neighbors during the re recovery and recession, you can sort of see in the Maryland flag, we're kind of middling, not too good, not too, not too hot, not too cold. Um, our underemployment and unemployment rate were lower than the rest of our neighbors. Uh, Virginia, um, a close second. Well, they don't have a football team or a baseball team, so they're no fun. Um, Eastern Shore, lots of these. Um, so I've often said that Maryland is, is, is Ed's, Beds, Meds, and Feds. So Ed's um, being our educational institution, you can sort of see that we have a lot of educational institutions spread out through the uh, state of Maryland. Big drivers in our economy. About 3% uh, of our economy is driven by education systems. Our military installations, we have about 17. Uh, our federal facilities, we have about, uh, it's like a bunch of them, maybe close to 30. So between ads, beds, meds, and feds, that's 26% of Maryland's GDP are driven by those four sectors. So a huge number. So a quarter of our economic activity is driven by those four factors. You can sort of see Maryland, at 12% of our GDP is driven by the federal government. So of those four factors, 26% are, 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 are Maryland's GDP. Almost half is driven by the federal government. So we are very dependent upon the federal government as a state. Which basically means if the state, if the federal government pulls back, we, we, we get hurt. And you can sort of see our employment sector as of October, you know, almost we have about 2.6 uh, million individuals in the labor force, about uh, a fifth are in the, in the government, all sectors of government, state, local, and federal. All the way down to management comes information. Our non-farm employment sort of looking out, outlook is probably about 1.7% um, going forward, uh, most recent data for 2017, and then 2018, 2019, we're looking at about a sub 1% growth um, in terms of uh, employment for the state of Maryland. These are the areas where we think we're gonna grow, um, for class employment growth by sector, construction, again, an area where we have under sort of, uh, we've always been sort of predicting this in, in sort of a growth area. Uh, manufacturing, we still, still think that jobs are going to be shed, though output will probably continue to go up. Information is newspapers, TV stations, um, 
which you sort of see generally are, are growth areas, professional and scientific ter uh, technical services, which are engineers, accountants, uh, lawyers, a combination of food services, which are ed, beds, and meds, and then educational services are sort of areas where they're growing well. Do I have any more time or am I out? Time, okay. Well, anyways, I won't go with this. I've left the slides for everybody, but the idea being is that Maryland is, 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 is challenged in the sense of basically it's going to uh, face a federal government that is, we saw it quite certain. We have a lot of uncertainty going forward. That uncertainty creates difficulty for businesses to make long-term plans. Once certainty is settled, I think that will sort of help Maryland. But we're looking at about a 1.7% growth in 2017 in employment and about a sub 1% growth in 2018, 2019. Again, our concern is sort of what the uncertainty is going to uh, yield. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs>